Good evening, I'm Jared Bowen, and welcome to this very special holiday edition of Greater Boston. We're revisiting some of the more memorable arts moments of the year, from a moonlighting nanny to the prized masterpiece landing in a local museum. But first, one of the biggest and most anticipated shows of the fall kicked off the Huntington Theatre Company's season. The Jungle Book is a brand new musical based both on the Kipling stories and the Disney film. For its creative team, it's all about coming home. From the wilds of Rudyard Kipling's India to a classic Disney film, The Jungle Book's latest chapter is a new musical. Based on Kipling's own childhood in India, The Jungle Book follows the young orphan Mowgli coming of age under the tutelage of his animal friends and mentors. But, says Mary Zimmerman, the musical's Tony-winning director, we are all written into the Jungle Book. You know, it really is leaving the jungle that, that all of us have to go through, leaving the wonderment of childhood into the, the world of adult power. Commissioned to create the musical adaptation several years ago, Zimmerman says she was immediately mindful of Kipling's own harrowing story, when at the age of eight, he was left by his parents in a brutal British boarding school. It was a really terrible place, and Kipling and his sister were very profoundly physically abused and possibly sexually abused and for Kipling to write about this as a Victorian more than once in his fiction and in his autobiography you know that it, he considered it a very serious and life-changing or shaping element of his life. In his later stories Zimmerman says Kipling yearned for the India in which he was first raised the India where she also took her creative team to begin adapting the piece. We're just gathering, gathering, gathering impressions and feelings and literally the way the light is hitting through a certain window or the way a bird flew up. I, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just sort of endless. One of the biggest hooks, though, was the Indian music, which music director Doug Peck infused with the film's jazz score for a rousing mashup. <laughs> Indian music doesn't use harmony in any sort of Western sense. However, what they do use is tremendous melodic and rhythmic complexity and always a goal that the music making is very vocal, is very soulful. project was the hardest project I've ever done. All of the show's creators are mindful of the weight of toying with a story, imagery, and music known to millions thanks to the movie. But Zimmerman says she both visually and musically quotes the film. She and Peck also had the added benefit of access to Richard Sherman, who along with his brother Robert wrote most of the original music, including songs that didn't make it into the film. He doesn't dictate every little element of what the arrangement, what the rhythm, what the harmony will be. He writes a song that he expects you to explode and take off on a journey with. He has genius advice on arrangement and he has such showbiz acumen and if it's, it's of a certain period but there's great charm. He's so complimentary all the time like a like a great father or uncle who's like Oh, you kids, it's just, it's just terrific. It's just terrific what you've done. It's just, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, it's so good. You know, and, and it, he just pours that on us. Proving that not unlike Kipling, you can go home again. In the world of fine arts, there have been a number of changes at the Worcester Art Museum. Since the arrival of its energetic new director two years ago, the museum has been evolving at a pretty rapid clip. That transformation continues as director Matthias Vasek returns to his European roots to change the way we experience art. There is plenty to behold, including what he calls a game-changing gift, a masterpiece by one of the greatest names in art history. There's plenty to behold in the Worcester Art Museum's European galleries. Their 16th to 18th century old master's holdings give us an enthralling Caravaggio. They deliver us El Greco, painting in his finest form after landing in Spain. And they offer us a Rembrandt to leave you transfixed. But, says director Matthias Vasek, the museum recently learned visitors are racing through galleries like they're a highway. It was just something like three minutes that the average visitor was staying here. It takes you a minute to walk through this gallery alone. 
So the goal was to make this a gripping experience. Vasek recently oversaw the complete rehanging of the galleries, an effort the museum titled Remastered. I love the title. It says this is work in progress, and we have absolute masterpieces in this, uh, in this gallery. And uh, we are, as every installation, uh, are giving our own personal spin to this. For Vasek, it is very personal. In rehanging the galleries, the director reached back to the art collections he visited growing up in Europe where paintings towered over him from soaring museum and palace walls. They also literally came at him, tilted in old world style, toward visitors. It gives the painting a material presence uh, in the gallery. It basically invades our space. The museum has also chosen to slow down visitors by giving them something to look at, not read. But something that I'm still wrestling in the hour or so that I've been here is the lack of labels. Yeah. It's hard for me. It's hard for everyone. Um, well, first of all, uh, it's interesting. Uh, we also looked how long people looked at labels. They didn't look that long at all. Uh, or they looked just at the labels, not at the paintings. Um, so we give alternative information. There are laminated guides, books, and tablets in the galleries, but the walls are pure. Not one word or name in sight. And the Worcester Art Museum is making a name for itself these days. The new jewel in its collection is Venus Disarming Cupid. One of the last Veronese masterpieces remaining in private hands, it was gifted to the museum late this summer. For Worcester Art, Vasek says, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We have a lot of highly dressed uh, 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 saints, um, uh, but we really lack luscious nudes. And we really lack uh, the uh, connection with another heritage uh, of our Western culture, which is that uh, of uh, antiquity and of joie de vivre. So that Venus puts joie de vivre uh, into our collection. And into the refreshed, the remastered spirit of the museum. Now, one of my favorite stories of the year. In 2007, a Chicago storage facility owner sold off the contents of five lockers to an auctioneer for just $750. But in those lockers was a treasure trove of photography produced by an intensely private nanny out to document the world around her. Her work is now a sensation. But there are also questions about how to show work its creator never had a chance to control. There were moments nearly every day, especially in the 1950s and 60s, that nanny Vivian Meyer would disappear wherever she was living. In cities like New York and Chicago, she quietly photographed. Street scenes, children, herself. Hardly anyone knew. She said, I want to be the mystery woman. So uh, she, she rejoiced in that on some level. But she was intensely private and she had locks on her doors and wouldn't let people into her, into her room. Adding to her mystery, Meyer rarely saw her own work. That was abundantly evident in 2007. Unable to pay the rent on her storage facilities, she saw their contents, including all her photography, auctioned off. There were more than 100,000 negatives, including some 2,700 undeveloped rolls of color and black and white film. That, for a professional photographer, is hard to imagine. Uh, to not be showing your, your work publicly. Since the auction and Meyer's death shortly after, her art world stardom has rocketed as gallery owners, curators, and collectors tout her as one of the great undiscovered talents of the 20th century. The Women's Studies Research Center at Brandeis University is exhibiting a selection of Meyer's work in a new show co-curated by scholar and photographer Karen Rosenthal. What do her photographs tell us about her? I mean, mm, there's a lot you can glean. Uh, she loved children, that's quite clear. Uh, she had tremendous empathy for their, uh, their sense of play, their curiosity, the emotional dramas that they lived with daily. She saw everybody in the society, and especially the ones that the society didn't acknowledge. She would go to the, to the south side of Chicago and photograph. Which she did with a basic Roloflex camera like this one. She was looking down into it. People didn't necessarily know what she was up to. She couldn't uh, draw these people close to her with a lens. She had to walk right into their space. The posthumous release of Meyer's work raises questions about how to consider it. 
It is not the artist, after all, who's decided which prints should be released, how they should look and be produced. It is others who are creating her legacy. People say that there are, that many art, artists were made by editors or gallerists who influence what is shown, what isn't shown. She may not have selected the best images when she printed them herself. And Rosenthal says it's also too soon, especially given that only a fraction of Meyer's work has been released, to decide where the photographer should rank in the eyes of critics. She's sometimes been called a copycat or an encyclopedia of, of all the photography that was going on in the 50s, and there was tons going on in the 50s. Uh, but when I examine that, I don't see that to be the case at all. I don't know anybody who photographed children the way she did, for one thing, or did self-portraits that were as imaginative and, and interesting, uh, or included so much of the world around her. Here, the pictures largely speak for themselves, even if the artist cannot. Well, this fall, I spoke with a number of photographers still very much working. She Who Tells a Story, a show still on view at the Museum of Fine Arts, aims to dispel some common Western perceptions about Middle Eastern women, namely that they're powerless and voiceless. These are some of the most resonant works of art coming out of the Middle East today. Blatant messages, cutting perspectives, and direct documentation. They are also produced by some of the strongest, unfiltered voices, women from Iran and the Arab world. We are human beings, you know, that we have stories to tell, that we're multi-layered and complex. We're not all terrorists, we're not crazy, we're not all extremists, and things are not as they seem. In She Who Tells a Story, now on view at the Museum of Fine Arts, women like Bushra Al-Mutawakil from Yemen have plenty to say, and more importantly, the freedom in which to express it. In her series Mother Daughter Doll, we see Al Mutawakel and her eldest daughter methodically disappear behind their hijabs until they are no more. I mean, Yemen is already a very conservative country, and uh, just in the past 10 years, it's become even more conservative with the spread of uh, um, different and more extreme forms of Islam, and it's literally um, become layers and layers of covering. I found that, it, that th this had nothing to do with Islam, that it was more of um, an expression of some kind of, you know, um, political view uh, of religion and also a form of control. What Westerners should try to see, she says, is what lies beneath. And so many women who are extraordinary and strong, doctors, lawyers, artists, you know, philosophers, they wear the veil. In Cairo, nearly a decade before the Arab Spring, Rana Nepp surreptitiously photographed subway travelers in her series, The Metro. When I was watching people and I was watching the space, I became very obsessed by how the space made people, how it made them so uh, absorbed and so kind of out of their bodies in a way. Nemp is quick to point out she photographed both men and women and has mixed oh, opinions of the MFA selecting only the latter. This specific collection tells me something about being really keen on negating that stereotype of women in the, U in the United States. And I think that's really good. I'm not sure I, if I would do it, I'd do it the same way. With an even more disparate vantage point, Rania Matar, who lives in the Boston area, returned to her native Lebanon for her series, A Girl and Her Room, in which she photographs young women whose identities are echoed in their bedrooms. They decide what they want to put on the wall. They're surrounding themselves with all these things they're going through and what they're choosing to be, you know. Um, at some point, though, it, it, um, I realized that 30 years earlier, I was the exact as those girls, the exact same thing. I mean, and, but I was growing up in Lebanon and with the backdrop of a civil war, and I was still the same young woman. Lebanon, Matar also notes, is among the most Western countries of those featured in the show, which gives her work a mystifying nuance. In Lebanon, it's important to note that um, there are a lot of religions. It is a Muslim country, but it's also a Christian country and a Jewish country. I mean, like, so it offers a lot of ambiguity there as well. And I like that, like some of these girls on the wall, you cannot tell if they're Muslim or Christian. And I probably won't tell you. She who tells a story 
quickly presents volumes of them. Next, when last we left the Rose Art Museum several years ago, it was embroiled in a lawsuit after the now former president of Brandeis University announced he would close the museum and sell off its major collection of modern art. Fortunately, that never happened. I recently sat down with the museum's new director about bringing the Rose back from the brink and why it's the perfect time for a show on Andy Warhol. Saturday Disaster is one of the Rose Art Museum's most iconic pieces. It's Andy Warhol's silkscreen of a horrific car wreck. He had an interest in the relationship of public emotion to public spe spectacle to image making. Christopher Bedford is the museum's new director. Hired last year to lead the Rose out of the disaster created when in 2009, Brandeis University attempted to close the museum and sell off its collection. Four years later, with both the museum and school under new leadership, the Rose, he says, is back and with Warhol at the center of its fall exhibitions. Given all that's happened recently, yeah. is it a bit of a, a reclamation? I think, I, I'm not sure I would use the term reclamation, but it is, I think it's, a, it's, it's an exclamation point. Not only did Is the Rose back in, in uh, full flower, but we have so much more than you imagined. One of the area's youngest museum directors at 36, Bedford says his immediate focus has been on reassimilating the rose for students on campus. This is a resource for them, an unusually rich resource in art history for them. Bedford says the rose now also has full university backing, and he's doggedly rebuilt the museum's board and donor base. Yes, the financial support has grown. In many respects, the Warhol show, Image Machine, is a testament to the museum's renewed vitality. As much of 90% of the exhibition comes from the Rose's deep Warhol holdings. Machine is a metaphor, too. The Rose has managed to reinvent, just as Warhol frequently did. Warhol was somebody who had intuitive understanding that painting, if it was to have a life, had to move into other directions. Photography was the basis of that work, to the point of obsessiveness. Warhol created some 100,000 photographs during his lifetime, including Polaroids, which he favored for their simplicity. They were an origin point for a lot of his work, and that they were almost like sketches. Particularly when you look at them, you lay them all out, um, and you see which one of the Polaroids eventually became a bigger work, you can see his mind at work. And I think that that's, that, that is, for me, is what makes them so interesting to look at. Warhol himself is a sketchbook for much of what we see today, Bedford says, including art and otherwise. You walk past, say, Crate and Barrel, and you see, you see a window, and the window is lined with, I, I don't know, 200 blue vases, which individually are completely uninteresting. But as an ensemble, and as a way to market, and as a total image, become extremely compelling. That investment in repetition is very Warholian. And it's been taken up as a, as a branding method. Which, of course, Warhol himself did, making the image machine a matrix of art, commerce and culture within photography, wallpaper and painting. It's this kind of totalizing effect, which feels to me, it's a world. I mean, it's you know, the Andy world. Mm -hmm. that, that was the desire. And a path for what was to come. In a pretty unprecedented move now, a host of Massachusetts museums and institutions united this past fall for a year-long celebration taking a look at four centuries of Massachusetts furniture. Two of the kickoff sites were the Concord Museum and Historic New England's Otis House. From the earliest colonial days, enterprising Massachusetts craftsmen had to furnish inventive ways of living. It really wasn't from the land. Uh, they had to find other things that they could do, and one of those was craft. And you have literally thousands of people over the uh, four centuries involved in producing furniture. Brock Job of Delaware's Wintertour Museum is one of the guiding forces behind four centuries of Massachusetts furniture, an unprecedented collaboration between 11 museums and institutions. I think it's surprising to realize that at least 150 million pieces not 1,000, but 150 million pieces of furniture were made here in the state over the past four centuries. This state 
was a premier spot for the production of furniture. We spoke with Job at historic New England's Otis House, a preserved 18th century mansion in Boston's West End. We're in the dining room of the Harrison Gray Otis House. Uh, the room is shown as it might have looked in Harrison Gray Otis's day. Uh, the table is set for a dessert course, but we have furniture in this room that comes out of a number of different houses here in Boston. Job says the furniture produced in Boston for the last three centuries had its own identity. You also have people here by the 1730s and 40s who were fourth and fifth generation Americans in, in every sense of the word. And they're coming up with their own distinctive, I hate to use the word provincial, but their own colonial expressions that are quite, quite um, different. Out at the Concord Museum, the singular work of 18th century cabinet maker William Monroe tells the story of an industrious and diligent craftsman who kept meticulous records and notes about his life. 1839, he had $20,000 in the bank, and you have to multiply that by 60 or 70 to get a sense of how much money that is. So for a craftsman, uh, that's very unusual, and uh, he, he's, he's just a unique guy. Curator David Wood says Monroe came of age when Boston was flourishing and was flush with cash. They were making furniture, and they were turning it over to other shops that were retailing the stuff. Uh, and it was it was very good furniture. It was it was it's just exquisitely crafted. Wood says Monroe had a signature style, from his angles to his inlay. It's the most complicated inlay that comes out that you find on any Boston furniture from this period. And actually, this particular pattern is found only on uh, William Monroe's timepieces. So apparently, he was making it himself. Monroe's fortunes changed dramatically after the War of 1812. With the economy tanking and no one buying furniture, he turned to pencils, a scarcity in America since they had come from England. It was immediate uh, success. He, as a furniture maker, he was making about $400 a year. As a pencil maker, he started making $4,000 a year, so he never looked back. But four centuries of furniture does, and with favor. Now the devastating 1990 heist at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum remains one of the most painful art thefts in the United States, if not the world. With a new exhibition on view through the spring, the Gardner has opened up about its loss in ways it never has before. Shortly after the Gardner Museum theft, director Anne Hawley received a call from French artist Sophie Cal, who counted the stolen Vermeer as one of her favorite works of art. Cal wanted to document the sudden absence that pervaded the museum. I, I don't think I brought emotion. I, maybe I, I brought a diversion. It just seemed that she had the grit and also could turn loss into some kind of work of art. In Last Scene, which has been shown around the world and now appears at the Gardener for the first time, Cal asked museum staffers to describe the stolen works. The idea was to do a portrait of the missing painting through people's memories. And I picked one phrase. I tried to make a portrait with not too many repetitions that was flu fluid, that was poetic, that works as a text. You can imagine what that did for people. And also, just she's such an interesting person. So it took people's minds off for a moment what was going on. Roughly 20 years later, the museum invited Cal back. In What Do You See, she again confronts absence, this time made even more profound by the museum's decision in 1995 to rehang the stolen painting's frames. Here, the artist posed questions to a variety of museum staff and visitors as they contemplated the missing works. I didn't ask them to describe the painting. I asked people, what do you see? And obviously, the staff members they still see a Vermeer or Rembrandt, but some of the visitors saw uh, an empty frame, a tapestry on the wall, a hall, and something they didn't understand why it was empty. One of the most haunting images features Holly herself, caught in reflection. 23 years of loss, staring back at museum patrons. What's it like for you to see the portrait, the picture where, where we see you? 
That was shocking to me because I didn't know that I would be reflected. I'm sort of staying away from it. I don't know. I really, I, I, when I saw it, I just turned away. Um, I, I was very surprised. And I asked her last night if she knew that she caught that reflection. And she said, yes. And I said, oh, why didn't you tell me? I just, you know, would have preferred to have been anonymous. It's poignant, though. Holly is now forever remembered just as she wants the paintings to be. Next, one of Broadway's biggest stars recently performed a holiday concert with the Boston Pops. Here, Tony Award winner Kristen Chenoweth, also known for a slew of film and television roles, talks about what Christmas means to her. I think music brings up all kinds of emotions. Um, and I know for me, especially at Christmas time and Christmas music, it, it brings back all those Christmases I had at home in Oklahoma with my family. And I actually am, I do celebrate the, the meaning of Christmas, too. So it all kind of goes in together for being with family for me. That's what the Christmas time and Christmas music makes me think. So when I'm not home, I really miss, you know, everybody. But the music that, um, that I sang on my Christmas album and some of which I'll be doing for the, for the, with the pops, I chose because I think that it is fun and I get to sing with the Boston Children's Choir and I get to just, you know, have a good time. And I haven't been back in 10 years with the pops, so um, this is a very prestigious orchestra and one that I've been kind of hankering to get back to. So I'm really glad that it's Christmas time that, that it worked out for me to come back. What is it like when you do have this sort of established relationship with an orchestra like the Boston Pops, with a man like Keith Lockhart? What is it like to just step back into it? It feels like home. When I landed last night, our plane was three hours late because there was all kinds of bad weather all over the country. But. I got in late, and <clears throat> as you know, it was freezing. It took my breath away. But I looked around because I've I've sung um, at your theaters in other uh, capacities as well, and shopped here. I've been I've been, I've helped your economy here <laughs> statewide. We thank you. You're welcome. Um, I f it feels kind of like home to me because, as you know, New York. I live in New York and L.A., but I'm more of an East Coast kind of girl. And um, when I come to Boston. It feels like home. And that is all for this year's holiday art special. We leave you now with the Boston Pops and its very inventive arrangement of the 12 Days of Christmas. I'm Jared Bowen, wishing you the happiest of holidays. On the second day of Christmas, what you love to be. And a party to the fair time.